<laughs> Hello, freak bitches. What's incredibly brave is that you, deep into your 20s, have this revelation and then have the courage to escape. And so I want to get back to that. Like, what was your job? Like, what did what was the first job you got? Uh, so I didn't get a job immediately. I thought I had to. I thought I have to be responsible. Like, of course, I'm with my sister. Like, we had some money saved. Just we lived at home. We didn't have a lot of expenses. Like, we we used our money to travel across the country picketing. But we, we still we still had some money. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so we gotta get out there and piss people off. <laughs> well, we and it was it was the, I thought it was the greatest. Like I thought like it was always exciting. Like, oh, are you going on this picket trip? Yeah, I'm going to Los Angeles. Oh We're my god! So it was just like a part of life. Yeah. You guys used to picket Scientology. A little. That's hilarious. Yeah, I remember doing it in Clearwater once too. It was super boring. Like there was nobody out there. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta rank the pickets by like <sighs> I don't know. George W. Bush's second inauguration was like insane. Oh, was it? And there's like Scientology. Oh yeah, that was like post 9/11. Must have yeah. been really rough to yeah. hold up those signs. Yeah, especially we had a sign that said "Thank God for 9/11." Oh and, God, damn it! And it was like we were stationed like at the intersection of these three streets, and they were blocked off for the parade. So like he finishes his inauguration speech, and this like huge crowd of people, like hundreds of that whatever, how many? Thousands, oh my God! Thousands of people like flood down this thing, and then they're stuck in this. In this intersection waiting to go right past us on this sidewalk and so there was like this uh you know, they're seeing this like thank god for 9 11 and it was right after the tsunami too uh so my mom had a son was holding the thank god for the tsunamis or whatever and um like so people are just enraged by the time they actually got to us so like we're standing like right at the edge of these barricades like so on the other side is the parade route and so like you know people were like jumping like some guy jumped on my back like and one another like stealing signs and like jumped on your back yeah like so i'm but i was like leaning over the barricade so he couldn't steal my signs sorry i'm not getting away from the mic and uh so like one of my cousins actually like gave his signs to another church member and then was like standing on top of a trash can like going come on you guys like just just don't worry about them they're not worth it they're not worth it like like, this is my cousin who was you know just because it was so it got so physical like you know people and like the cops so like, he was saying you guys aren't worth it he was trying to yeah He's pretending, pretending like he, he was, was one not, of them yeah exactly oh wow yeah so that, that, one, that one got pretty yeah pretty got pretty dicey but did it get violent like it, the guy who it, jumped on your back like what did he do so he, i will i'm holding my signs and i'm like like i've tucked myself into this barricade so like there's nothing else he can do right so he and there was like there was i should also say there were cops just on the other side of the barricade just like like every five feet there was a cop. I think there was said there was like maybe fourteen thousand cops in DC that day because it was our first inauguration after nine eleven. So anyway, but so I mean, the, and the cops were mostly just standing there. Like I look over, the, the guy gets off, and um, look, my my brother is standing next to me, who's seven or eight, eight years. So he would have been like early twenties, and uh, um, this. I see, and then when he jumped over the barricade because the way people were coming after us, and this cop like pulls out a, a you know club to and in, in making us get back over the bar like jump back over on the other side like with these people who were and not really doing anything. But it. it but I did you saying, expect the cops to risk their lives, even though you're obviously provoking people? I mean, you're obviously putting yourself in a situation where you're saying something incredibly insulting. And just devastating to all these people that lost friends or loved ones on 9-11 or in the tsunami or mm -hmm. or have family members that are gay. I right. mean, did you guys really expect the cops are going to take the beating for you or the cops are going to get involved? Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, we thought that. <laughs> it was like, it's their job, right? But if they didn't, you would <laughs> never do what you did then, right? Like, what if, what if someone passed some sort of a law saying, listen, you guys know what you're in for. We have no desire to help you. There would be no police presence. Would you still protest? Well, we did that. I mean, some, some cops did respond that way. Did some... they say like, there will be no pre police presence whatsoever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and some... Where was that at? Can't remember. Right? But it happened but more than once. More than once. Yeah, for sure. And uh, like sometimes the cops would, we'd say we're going to come to protest this, you know, something and, and they would say, you know, you can come, but you can't hold that sign or you can't they would step, tell you. step on the flag or whatever. Sometimes they would tell us in advance. Sometimes they would wait till we got there. You guys there. would step on the flag? Yeah. Like we, desecrating the flag was a big, we saw it as an idol and, you know, the American flag is an idol. Actually, my mom got arrested. I had a, we were in Nebraska and, um. Uh, my little brother, we were protesting a soldier's funeral, and we were, like, far away from the church. Um, but there was a, a group of people on the other side of the street, and they were you know, all holding American flags all the way from, from the road, all the way up this, you know, the long entry to the to the church. So we were quite far away. 
And uh, my brother was nine years old at the time, and he did what he always did, which was, uh, you know, put down, lay the American flag on the ground and stand on top of it and hold a picket sign. <sighs> and within like a couple of minutes, uh, like nine cops showed up uh, and started talking about arresting my mother uh, for flag mutilation and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. And uh, so before they do the arrest, you know, again, my mom and my uncle were both there and they are both lawyers. And my uncle was like, uh, you know, Johnson versus Texas, the Supreme Court said in that case that uh, you can even you can mutilate. Not only can you mutilate a flag, you can even burn it. And uh, and that's perfectly lawful. And one of the cops was like, we're not in Texas. We're in Nebraska. So, like, this is obviously a Supreme Court case, so it's, and he said, the Supreme Court has jurisdiction all over the country. So, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, like, the the way that so, sometimes the they did, sometimes there were really good cops who did their job and were super professional and didn't let their beliefs about our, you know, religious beliefs or their what they thought about our message get in the way of them doing their job, but... Sometimes they did. Sometimes they would threaten to arrest, you know, my our parents if they brought children. They would take their children away from them, you know, things like that. But, but we absolutely expected them to to do their jobs like that. That was, and this is, the Supreme but Court. You, yeah. I mean, I know you're not justifying it, but it's from the point of view of something like me, mm. uh, someone like me. I I would say. Don't bring any cops there. No, if you if you start that kind of shit at a funeral or for a soldier and a bunch of people come by and beat your ass, well, then don't do that again because you're pissing people off and you're hurting their feelings and you're dealing with someone who's already emotionally scarred. Those cops need to be out there stopping robberies and, you know, breaking and enterings into people's houses and carjackings. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. They're not supposed to be, like, helping out people who are intentionally provoking and emotionally... Uh, d disturbing people right but I mean so obviously from the church's perspective it's like this it's these are sincerely held religious beliefs and right. the First Amendment like what good is the First Amendment like this obviously this uh, but it's not a First Amendment issue like the but because the it's no one in an official position is saying you cannot speak well so uh, to compare that to like the campus what's going on on these campuses right where right. so you think that the cops shouldn't be there to protect those people well, they're they're provoking people and making them angry well right? it's a different sort of a scenario um, I think the cops should definitely be there to prevent violence on campus for several reasons. One reason, because I think you're dealing with very young, very impressionable people who make very poor choices and feel justified because they're around a bunch of people that also have like-minded ideas, a lot of peer pressure, a lot of um, diffusion of responsibility that comes from these mass groups of people that are acting and the m mob mentality that comes along with that. I think it's very very important to protect them from themselves and it's a hot button issue i think protesting at a soldier's funeral is just gross i agree with you yeah i mean i know you do yeah i know you do i mean but i'm just saying like i don't think the cops have a responsibility to save you from being gross yeah i just i i don't know i mean obviously this was a supreme court case it became a did you know that that it this there was a case where we were sued by the the church and yeah i do remember that how, and how that play out uh, it it went all, first they they won a 10.9 million dollar verdict against us at the trial court and then it was reversed at the appeals court and the Supreme Court said eight to one they have it's the constitutional right for them to do this this is right. their religious beliefs they have a right they were especially because I mean sometimes I will say like I, I described to you that very first picket soldiers funeral picket that I went to like that was very close quarters you know it, mm -hmm. we were right up on top of them like if we had chosen to sing or what you know that you know, they would have heard us. But in a lot of instances, we were way far, far away. Like in that, in the instance that went to the Supreme Court, they were more than a thousand feet away. There was like a hill. The, right. the, they, the family didn't see church members, you know, things like that. It, there was, uh, so, I mean, they have a right to do it. Who I, has a right? Well, the, the church. I right. mean, okay. I they mean, have a right to decide. They have a right to do it. To say horrible things about someone who just died or who, someone who lost a son or a daughter in war. Yeah. I think, obviously, I, I don't, I think it's terrible that they do do it. And that was actually one of the things, you know, before my sister and I left, that was one of the, I wasn't going to hold a sign that I didn't believe was true. And I wasn't going to go to any more funeral protests. 
Right, but do you think that the police should? I mean, they're they're operating on tax dollars, and it's a limited amount of resources. Well, we're tax. I mean, we're taxpayers, right. right? I mean, sure you are, but do you think that the resources should it's go? It's hard to, to get the, out of the, the we mentality. We think, right, yeah. I know, I know. I'm, I, but do you think that really that the cops that's the an uh, an intelligent and adequate and fair use of resources to go and protect a bunch of troublemakers? So it depends on what, how do you how do you feel about the First Amendment? Like it, it's 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 the principle of the thing rather than mm-hmm. the application. So like this right. is just one application. Like so. So who's to decide exactly, whether or not it's that's, right? That's the whole idea. Like so, who what we have not entrusted our government to decide what opinions are acceptable and what aren't. So they they don't they they don't get to have like so. Right, but it seems like you're organizing this. So if you're you organizing this sort of uh, antagonistic display where you know you're gonna. Hurt we someone's feelings make in a very mad. dangerous time. Right. Don't you think you should hire your own security? Like, why should the police have to be there to secure you? Because because this it's the law. Like they they are supposed to you know protect. Like the again, what what good are so First Amendment rights? Right. The like to be able to to say it's it doesn't protect popular speech, right? Because right. popular speech doesn't need protection. Unpopular speech needs protection. So it's just. Again, it's the but the police are really there to enforce laws. Well, they're the not law there is you don't get to punch protection. somebody, right? right? But they're they're just assuming but you know, that if something you know, is going to go bad. Okay, so for instance, like go, just back to the campus thing for a second. Right. You have these people who have announced we're going to go protest this person. We're not going to let them speak, even though they've been granted permission by the you know mm-hmm. everybody. Like they're going, they should be able to speak, right? right. Well, we're not going to let them speak because we don't like their message. So if the cops know that that's going to happen. Like so, so what happens? Like I'm just trying to compare this. They don't do anything this. about it. They let them shut it down. Um, but I'm saying I, I think that's wrong. I think they they should be able. They should go and like. So this is what. So they, you think the cops a should be able veto to? Is what it's called, right? I think in in, in like the, the cops can't say. Well, obviously this is still back to like, it's not if the cops say, well you can't speak because you're likely to cause a riot or people to you know some some kind of disturbance. Like they're not allowed to do that based on like if it's just this is religious opinion. We weren't saying we want you to hurt us. We're not trying to provoke you to hurt us. We're trying to deliver this message that we think is the truth of God. Right. So it wasn't there's a difference between like deliberately provoking and inciting violence, like deliberately inciting violence and what we were doing, which was, you know, trying to proclaim this message that we thought was the truth. Our goal wasn't violence. Like we didn't want violence. That's why we contacted the cops. Right. right. I understand we were going to attack them, and and we didn't want to be attacked. We just wanted to be able to exercise our rights without fear of, without fear of, of violence. That that's that's the principles of of our democracy. Right. Um. So I see what you're saying, and I think that it's it's it gets a little weird when we're talking about people giving speeches on campus and then having other people shut down those speeches. Because I think that the people who are protesting have as much right, especially if it's in their school, they have as much right to voice their concern for this message as the person does to distribute that message. And if the police come along and say, we're going to shut down the distribution of this message, most of the time they do it when things are out of hand. So an excellent tool for someone who's trying to silence people is to make sure that things get out of hand. I mean, Which that's, is why so that having the cops present right. like, and, and letting both sides have their voices without res- the ability to resort to violence. So this mm-hmm. is the whole idea, like we would, in these letters that would go out to the cops, was that the idea of having a buffer zone, like, a, like yes, we're gonna, we wanna proclaim our message, we want you to be out there too. Like we loved, and honestly, we loved it when counter protesters were there because it just brought more attention to our message. Yeah, which was- I understand that, but I just think that you shouldn't, obviously it's not you anymore, but I just do not think that anybody, especially from an offensive group like that, should be able to allocate resources that are public use, like well, police. Well, so we like obviously you, we didn't make the decision. All obviously, over town. like we didn't make the decision to right. for them to like they decide like okay, well, is this likely going to like so they can either right. be proactive and set the buffer zone or be reactive like we're calling the cops because we're getting punched right. or whatever, and because like they're gonna go out no matter what. So we we when even when they would say we're not gonna protect you, we're we would go. Right. I mean, there were obviously there were rare situations where, uh, so for instance, like uh, when Gabby Giffords was shot in Arizona, uh, we had a couple of um, an FBI agent actually and a, a guy from the local police department come and say like, you shouldn't go and because there, there was a nine year old girl who had been killed. Yeah. And the church said they were going to protest her funeral. Oh Jesus. And uh, so they said, 
I don't think we can protect you like this. It's too volatile. It's too. Uh, and so in that case, we didn't act, we actually didn't go. That's kind of a chicken shit response. <laughs> actually, no. I was, was going to say, uh, like, so, so the, the thing is, so I was there during this conversation and I heard my mom was explaining that we weren't going to go. Um, it actually had more to do with logistics. Like we couldn't get there, like plane tickets and whatever. Like we just couldn't get there. So it was like, okay, like, that's God. fine. Like I hear you. But you're like, so reasonable. It's so fascinating to talk to you. Because you're such an intelligent, reasonable person. It's almost impossible for me to imagine until I see like the little bit of resistance to the idea of this being a First Amendment issue and the police there. Then you kind of go back to the church. I could see it boil (laughs) up inside of you. Well, it's just like we were talking about this a a little bit ago. I mean, just the whole the importance of discourse in the marketplace of ideas. This is one. Yeah. Like, like, again, I, I, I just think it's so important and I think it's important, you know, because obviously my own personal experience makes me such a believer in. Well, you've gone on a journey through free speech mm-hmm. that most people never experience free speech that you don't even agree with anymore. Right. Yeah. Which is even more crazy. 